it's of course a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so hello everyone. So um, Emily Mari uh, said I, I, I am uh, I've been working on theory about optimal transport in the past uh, let's say three four years, uh, and I I hope I can show you some insights about that theory and how it can be used in practice and where it has branched out a bit in recent in recent years. So I will be covering both the basics and I will try to go deeper into some applications later in the course. But knowing that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch now, I think I'll just focus for the next 45 minutes on things that are easy and uh, maybe visually appealing. So uh, as I said, we, we wrote a survey that, that will be published very soon in the, the Foundations and Trends in Machine Learning uh, series. Uh, so the, 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 the definitive version should be available anytime soon. Uh, right now it's available on this website and on, on our archive. So, uh, of course, a lot more material there than there is in the slides. So if you have any questions, please to, to either interrupt me, of course, or, or talk with me later during the day. I will be here until Friday evening. So um, to start, I thought it might be a good idea to, to connect this to, to previous courses in the summer school, uh, in particular Arthur's and uh, Sebastian's. And so I will start with Gans. So if you were here uh, yesterday for the discussion on how to write a good paper, let's just assume that Gans are amazing and are the best thing to work on right now. And then <laughs> I can start my next slide. <laughs> Otherwise, if you have no interest in Gans, maybe this is not the best example. But I will show you other examples that are, that are nice. So to go back to really basics, uh, uh, a big of what we do eventually can be summarized as the following thing. We see data. Unfortunately, data from a mathematician perspective is given as a bunch of points. You have really a bunch of measurements. And the size of those measurements can be very large, right? And can be bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we want to do as statisticians, machine learners, is to find a good grammar to describe that big, big bunch of points using less details, maybe less, less parameters. And so the statistics 0.0, .0 course would tell you, well, what we can do is we define a family of densities, those are probability distributions, defined on the same space as the space where the data points lie. So let's say here it's just R2, okay? So two, two, each point is described by two variables. And then we have Gaussians, which have, can take very vari uh, various forms. They're pretty much constrained to look like ellipsoids, but at least we have a, a big uh, freedom to choose what the shape of the ellipsoid and where the location of the ellipsoid lies. And then the, our job is basically to make that thing look increasingly like the data. And uh, usually we do this through an iterative process, or sometimes we have closed form formulas, of course, for Gaussians. But what our goal is essentially is to find a good density that looks like our data. And the way to score to give a good metric of how that density looks like this bunch of points is not an obvious question. I mean, it, there's, there's uh, as we will see later, there's various ways you can come up with. But there's one that seems to work very well and has been proposed by Fisher about 100 years ago, and that's maximum likelihood estimation. So you have this young uh, Ronald Fisher there writing this paper, and then he says what we should do is maximize the log likelihood of the sample, the density. So what it is it? It's just simply taking the value of the density p theta at each of the points x i, taking its log, and then maximizing this sum. So I'm sure 99.9% .9 here of people in the room know about this, of course. What we forget usually is that there is a strong assumption there, which is maybe natural, which is that p theta of x i must be positive for every observation, right? you need to have a density that somewhat covers the entire space. Whatever any new point might appear, you need that the density there is positive. So there is some idea that something might happen there. If this is not the case, well, no, no, the this framework doesn't work, but you can see it immediately in the fact that we're using those, those logs in the, in, in the maximum likelihood estimation framework. So what you can think is this, this idea of maximum likelihood uh, estimation can also be interpreted as a geometric uh, per principle. It's the idea that, well, if you just look at the formula, you might want to find a density in the space of densities. So here, my 
big red ball is all my densities that I have that, that I can uh, play with, and my data here is not in the same that same ball. Of course, the data is given as a sum of points, Dirac's, and this, those are here smooth densities. And we will try to find something that looks a bit like this in this red ball. And it's not going to be a projection, so I'm not going to just simply draw a line and try to find the closest point in this set of densities. It's going to be something a bit more um, subtle, and it's going to be a kullback liber divergence projection. So it would be the, th the thing here, the density that looks the most like my discrete density, my discrete uh, measure, sorry, in terms of kublak liber geometry. So I will not elaborate too much on this, but just to give you this, this feeling that behind maximum likelihood estimation, there is some geometry somewhat uh, at play. Now, let's think about this idea, but with a much... Sorry, I think I went too far. Let's think about this idea, but with something that's a bit more uh, complicated than just points on the plane. Let's think about this problem where you are dealing with let's say, vectors of dimension 30,000. So this, this would be uh, like an image, uh, which is 100 times 100 pixels, and then has three color channels, right? So that you have 30,000 different values. And because those are images, they are bound to be somewhere in the hypercube. So the, the intensities are between 0 and 1. Normalized intensities would be between 0 and 1. So then you can ask, what can I, can I provide with a good model for the density of natural images on, on the planet? Okay? If, I were to, if I was some omniscient entity that knows everything about what can happen on the planet, then there is a distribution of probability of images on, that, on the planet, and somewhere it fits in this hypercube, and it tells me this, this, these images are likely to happen or not. Now, if you think about this in, in, in the previous term that I just explained, the maximum likelihood estimation scheme, this seems like a pretty daunting task, right? Because you would need to parameterize densities on this space of dimension 30,000, and then you would need to estimate the parameters of those densities. So imagine just with the Gaussian, it's, which is arguably the most simple distribution we can think of, then it's already a big, big issue, right? So there are other ways, of course, workarounds uh, for this. You could, for instance, project the images in the lower dimensional subspace, uh, describe them with some elementary features, and then do density on that space. But then that, that wouldn't really allow you to sample from that, that density, because you, what you would be doing is sample features, right? And you can't easily build up an image back from features. So the problem that you have is, how can we basically come up with something, a generative model for, 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 for something that's so high dimensional? And uh, the, the, the nice answer provided in the last in recent years in the community is basically GANs and more generally generative models for, for, for things that are very, very high dimensional. So let me just uh, again rehash what uh, Arthur and Sebastian uh, told you, and I will maybe give you this in, a, in my, my own way. Um, what the idea is, is instead of working on densities directly, on parameterized densities in dimension 30,000, which is really too ambitious, what we will do is we will just consider probability measures on this data space, on the space of images, which are not necessarily densities. They're just what people call push forwards or generative models using another latent space of a lower dimensional, of lower dimension. So let me just tell you how it would work. Here we have the data space, that's 30,000, and let's say the latent space, we define it, we set it in stone, we say that it's uh, dimension, let's say, R100, and I'm going to define a, a measure on that smaller space, which will be uniform on the hypercube, or maybe a Gaussian, or anything I want. Now, what I will be, the, the main subject of my study will not be densities here, what I will be dealing with is functions that go from this latent space to the data space. So, and those functions, I'm going to parameterize them by uh, some theta. It's not the same theta as the densities. It's just to say that there is a family of functions now that go from this small space to the big space. So what does it look like in practice? Well, it would be something like, I have a small vector of 100 values, between all between 0 and 1, let's say. And I come up with a family of functions that's interesting enough to map a small vector into an image. So, of course, you might think, what kind of function takes 10 numbers or 100 numbers and creates an image of size 100 times 100? 
Well, um, it's not obvious to come up with such an idea, but in the community, especially in the computer vision community and, and the neural networks community, this subject is actually an important one. And there are some very nice uh, uh, classes of functions to do exactly that job. Take a few values and output some image. And those, those networks are called the convolution networks. So you could see them really as going backwards from a convolution network that you maybe are more familiar with when you do image classification. So let's just assume there are the deconvolution networks. Let's just assume that we have a nice parameterized family of f thetas, of functions that take small vectors and, and, and create images. Now the problem is, imagine that I take all the points in this space and I map them through this function f theta. So a point z here would go through f theta of z. And what I'm interested in, and I, I guess you, you've, you've, you've guessed it, is actually what is this kind of manifold, the image of this latent space here in the data space. And what I want to find out is whether this thing here is, looks at all like the data that you've given me. And I'm going to use a mathematical notation here, but I think you will you have a good intuition of what it means now. I will, I will detail it later. I'm going to use this push forward operator. So what is a push forward operator? Well, it's essentially something that says, if you take a measure in some space and apply to each point of that measure the same function, f theta, what measure do I get in the end in the, in the, in the target space? Okay? So this manifold here is this push forward measure. And the problem of generative models and GANs is essentially find a good theta such that this manifold looks like your data, okay? So it's no longer find a density over here. It's more something that's a bit more, uh, less ambitious. And it's essentially find something that's a bit more thin, but that looks a bit like the data. And you can imagine that when you will change the values of theta, you're going to torture a bit this, this manifold, make it move a bit. And then what you want is each time you will change the theta value, you want this manifold to look a bit more to ad adapt a bit more to your data. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, when you think about this problem, you start thinking, can I use MLE? And because of what we said earlier, no, you can't. Because if you replace in P theta here, the push forward measure, F theta sh sharp mu, and you compute the probability of this thing here, well, you can see very clearly that actually this is zero almost everywhere. You can't fill up the space, you can't fill up a 30,000 dimensional space here by taking 100 vectors here, uh, a, a set of, hundred vec uh, of vectors of dimension 100 and apply a function to all of them, right? It's very intuitive that this must be thinner than the entire space and there's no reason why, if you start with the parameter theta, you will be able to find a manifold that goes through all of the points, right? So this doesn't work, maximum likelihood doesn't work, so what could work? And that's the question you can ask. We need a more flexible way to measure the difference between this manifold here and the blue points. And I think at this, at this point, you, following Arthur's lecture, you probably have in mind, oh, but Arthur already gave me a, a nice answer, and that might be MMD, right? And you're right, this, this, this is one of the possible answers. And more generally, in stats, what's interesting is to, to see that this problem actually was given a lot of focus following this work by, by, uh, by, by, by the, the authors of the GAN paper, which basically tried to find, come up with a, a discrepancy that would be something, uh, try to come up with, for, for a good proxy of such a discrepancy. And so let me just illustrate briefly what the idea was. I'm not going to, I'm not very precise mathematically, but this is just a broad concept. The idea was to say, okay, imagine my, my points, data points are here, my manifold, as it is right now, my, my theta, as I chose it right now, basically creates that, that part of the uh, data space. Now imagine I want to uh, classify this. I want to be able to distinguish these two things. Well, first what I will do, because I'm using computer, is sample. And to sample from that manifold is actually trivial, right? The only thing you need to do is just sample from this latent space a few vectors. I already gave you the measure on this latent space, so I just randomly draw some points in this latent space, and I apply this, this function. So I have, I have this set of points here that have sampled. Now, 
this set of blue points is very different from this set of red points, right? And what can I get from this? Well, what I can get from this is the fact that it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to classify them, to be able to distinguish the blue points from the red points. And so in this case, it's clear that I can get a high classification accuracy See, I, if I try to, 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 to work a bit harder on classifiers. Now, imagine that I would get this manifold and this point, then here's a lot more a lot harder to classify uh, the blue from the reds. So this is the idea of the, of the original Gantt paper. So the, the uh, natural way to come up with a nice discrepancy between sets of points is to see how well you can classify them. And if you really have a hard time classifying them, then it means that the two sets or the two measures are more or less uh, are overlapping a lot. Now, this first proposal was followed then by, by, by a few other papers which basically said, okay, this is a nice proxy for a distance between measures, but there is a lot of work on this describing or, I mean, using distances between probability measures that, that are maybe grounded on more geometrical thinking. Can we try to find something? So if eventually, can we do this minimization on any discrepancy delta that's not necessarily the kullback library divergence? And if you go back in stats, this idea has been around for a long time. Uh, the idea that kullback library is not the panacea, it's not, the, it's not always the best thing to do. And uh, if, if you look at early works here, for instance, in the 80s, people were actually quite convinced of this. So you have this nice paper, minimum chi-square, not maximum likelihood, exclamation mark. So I haven't seen that many New Reps papers <laughs> recently using exclamation marks, but I think it's cool. So maybe I might consider doing this. Uh, then there is minimum Hellinger distance estimation, in which, of course, you would use the Hellinger distance. There is a lot of work. And uh, Arthur at some point mentioned this when he was showing these two ellipse ellipses where total variation was the only divergence between F divergences and integral probability metrics. So people have really considered how can we do estimation with total variation? And uh, Arthur mentioned that it was a bit complicated computationally, it's true, and then there is, there is a body of work on this by Luc de Vroy and Gabor Lugosi. And then uh, uh, in 2006, there was a paper uh, that was called on minimum distance estimators. So it's, it's, it's that idea. It's to use something called the Kantorovich distance as delta to try to do estimation. So since then, uh, in the GAN world, there has been a lot of, a lot of papers. So as Arthur mentioned, there are, there's been a few using MMD. Uh, I, I kept, I think I stopped at those published before 2017. Uh, then Eventually, there were some papers that started popping up using Wasserstein distance. So for those of you, I mean, I will, I will explain this immediately, but Wasserstein distance is the same thing as Kantorovich distance. It's, uh, there's a lot of names under this idea. And then what we've seen is more recently, oops, sorry, more recently papers that try to uh, bridge a bit between MMD and, and, and Wasserstein. So part of my, my talk today will be to introduce those ideas about the Wasserstein distance and also show you how you can actually interpolate between Wasserstein distances and MMD s using some, some, some computational uh, regularization. So this, this will be a bit uh, the, the, the main part of my, my, my talk later. So since this uh, is a talk about optimal transport, let me just introduce you to this, this theory roughly. The, what, what are the main ideas? So. All those papers about Wasserstein GANs and uh, Wasserstein uh, uh, estimation, etc., Katorovich estimators, rely on this idea that there is a good or natural distance between probability distributions called the Wasserstein distance and that we should be using it in statistics. So the story of the Wasserstein distance actually goes back to uh, the 18th century and the, the first person that uh, proposed ideas in this line is called Monge. So is, I will explain a bit more about Monge later. But then people that are very famous in this field uh, are Kantorovich and Kupmans because they got, in part, the Nobel Prize for these ideas in the 70s. And then there's been a long list of mathematicians that have been working on this uh, beautiful theory of optimal transport. So usually they approach it from a very different angle from the, the, than the one we have. They are interested in, in partial differential equations. They are interested in, in, in optimal transport and uh, 
in far more advanced uh, geometric settings than the one which we consider, but still we can find a lot of guidance and interesting work in what they did. And uh, the, so there, there is, uh, of course, I can't continue this list without mentioning Danzig, who actually proposed, uh, is the father of linear programming and proposed a computational solution to solve this optimal transfer problem. Then we have uh, a few mathematicians, Bonnier, Gangbo, Thomas Kahn, and then more recently, Villani, uh, and Figali, so a French and an Italian uh, a mathematician who both got a Fields Medal for their work uh, in the field. So Villani got it in 2010 and F Figali got it in, in last August. So optimal transport is, you could characterize it as a good, a natural geometry to compare probability distributions. So as I will show later, it's also related to, to MMD. It's very different from F divergences and it, 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 is, it leaves a bit in this space of how you can compare to probability distributions. And it has some very nice features and characteristics. So let me just try to, 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 to tell you when and why it could be useful. And why it's useful to compare probability distributions. So in statistics, I guess we all agree that we are always playing with densities, p theta, p theta prime. We, we just try to change parameters or generative models here. But if you look around you, in many applications of machine learning, we are constantly describing things as probability distributions or histograms. So a typical uh, example is the bag of words representation for text, in which you would describe a text as, as just a histogram of frequencies of words. Uh, in many natural phenomena, when there is some uncertainty, maybe uncertainty because your measurement is not of very good quality, you would typically switch to a probabilistic perspective. Okay, instead of saying, this part of the cortex is lit up for this patient, you would say, oh, there is some area there that seems to be working. I'm not completely sure about it, but there is some uncertainty, and this is wh what I, where I think the thing is going on. And then there would be a probability distribution. In, uh, in image processing, probabilities, of course, appear everywhere. One of the most simple examples is this idea of color histogram or color palette. And in any of those cases, it's it's relevant to compare two of those histograms. And in that case, what optimal transport does essentially is to say, I have a good way to compare those two histograms or to those two probability distributions, as long as I have a good way to compare two of the things on which those hi uh, histograms or measures are supported. So it's like a meta distance, which works by defining a distance on things and gives you automatically a distance on the histograms of things or probability distributions of things. So if I have a distance between words, optimal transport gives you automatically a nice distance between histograms of words. If you have a distance on the cortex, which is usually the case, I will have a nice distance between activation maps on the cortex. If I have distances between colors, and that's not a far-fetched thing to, th I mean, it's easy to compare blue and, 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 and violet, then I will have a nice distance between histograms of colors. And here in the, in the generative model issue problem, so then you can argue, is there a natural distance between, for instance, every image and any image on the manifold? Then this is a bit harder, and then we will go back again to what Arthur was mentioning about maybe estimating some, some, some uh, kernel in, in the case of Arthur, or here it would be a distance. So the talk will be split into an introduction now. I'm going to, to give a, bu uh, bu a bit more math. Then I will define, uh, describe some algorithms that can help you solve this optimal transport problem at scale, and I, I will show you some, some applications. So in the time that I have left, uh, I am going to um, present to you two original ideas that, that really, really shape the, th the, the field of optimal transport, and they come both from, they come from Monge and Kantorovich. So this is like uh, very early, very early intuition. And then this afternoon, I will continue by, by, by digging a bit deeper into the math. So this is Gaspard Monge. And so as you see, can see, he lived through actually the French Revolution, which is itself is a, is a notable thing, <laughs> especially for a scientist. And uh, he, was, uh, he was actually a very brilliant mathematician, and he participated in the exploration uh, of na na Napoleonic, con con I mean, I don't want to say conquest, but uh, 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 explorations and when he was trying, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm, I, I'm realizing I'm, uh, I'm touching a touching subject here. So, mm. but anyway, he was a 
he was an excellent mathematician and he created a lot of uh, institutions now in France that are still uh, very active, just such as uh, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, which is a fairly big uh, university in, in Paris. Uh, so what Gaspard Monge is also famous for if you live in Paris is there's lots of places in Paris that bear his name. So there is one Place Monge here and I was surprised to see that in the South Africa TripAdvisor website, it seems to appear as the top 323rd thing to do in Paris out of 2,270 things. So it's not too bad, I think, for a place named after a mathematician. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subway station, of course, but it's also a nice, uh, a nice uh, place, and it's also a, a nice square, and it's also a famous street in Paris. So anyway, we like to name things after mathematicians in Paris, so you, you can find a lot of those places. Now, let me go back to the subject. So Monge wrote in, in 1781 uh, a, a treaty, a memoir here, and I'm going to translate it to you roughly. He says, when you need to bring earth from one place to another, then there's, you should be thinking about what you're doing if you don't want to be too stupid. And uh, the, 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 the illustration is this one. Imagine that you have some pile of sand somewhere lying, and you need to fill up some hole, okay? So you need to bring that sand here and you will need to put it somewhere else. And the, the important thing here is that you, can, you, can, you know that the exact volume of sand that you have available to start with here is the same as the volume of sand that you will need to fill up. So in, in short, we have two probability distributions. Now the question uh, Monge asks is, if I am a, a public worker, and, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm working for a public work, uh, construction work, and I want to bring that sand, what can I do? So this, 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 this problem now sounds a bit stupid because if you have a plower or anything, you would just bring all of the sand in one go and you don't need to optimize anything, right? We, we're not really optimizers for this kind of thing. But what you have to think is that in that time, the only thing that you had access to, of course, was a shovel, right? So you really needed to actually go from one place to another and bring, bring the sand. So Moore's problem is, I need to find, to provide a worker with an instruction, which is if you find some sand at a location X, and this would be the amount of sand here at a location X, please bring it to a location T of X. And I'm giving you T. Okay, T is a map that goes from the real line to the real line. Later, we'll go from the space to the same space. And bring all of the sand that you find there to y here is equal to t of x, and fill up that infinitesimally small amount of sand at that location. Now, what you will need to pay as a price for this is, first, the distance is obvious that if x and t of x are very far away one from the other, then I need to walk and bring the sand. But you can also assume that the cost that you will need to pay for this is also proportional in the amount of sand that you are actually carrying. Okay, if, if you're taking some little heap of sand here and you have to carry 10 meters, it's not the same thing as if you were taking a, uh, really taking the big, the big chunk of sand here that's in the middle and ca carrying it three, 10 meters. So the basic assumption is to say the work, the infinitesimal work that I'm doing here each time is mu of x, the mass at x, times the distance between x and tx. Now, Morse can come up with such a map. It's pretty easy to come up with a map which says, okay, take anything that's at x and bring it x plus 10, okay? So that would be a, a, a map, t of x equal x plus 10. Does it make sense? Well, no, because I asked Morse to bring this mass of sand here to fill up exactly this hole, right? So if we need to fill up the hole, we need to be careful in the way we define this application, this map. And what, what is it exactly that we want? Well, it is the following. If there is some segment here that I'm considering, there is some sand that will land in that segment B if, you, if I use this map T. And I can actually define the inverse in, the, in terms of sets of this set B as all the point X's that land in B. Okay? All the point X's such as T of X is, is belo belongs to B. Now, for this particular t that you've given me, this might be those three segments here, right? So maybe Moore said, told the worker that the amount, the sand here goes, let's say, there, etc. And then from different areas, he, he told the worker to bring some sand in, in, in the segment B. 
Now, what is natural, of course, is that the amount of sand that I need to fill up here with the segment in the segment is the same as the amount of sand that is available at those three segments, right? So, in short, what I need is that the measure, the volume of sand in those three locations is identical, is equal to the amount of sand that I need to land there. And, of course, I need this to be observed for any segment B, not just this one. And what I need, then, is that the inverse of any set B, the volume of the inverse of any set B under this function T is equal to nu of B. And this is what people call a push-forward constraint. The push-forward is basically what happens when I take this measure mu and I apply a map T to every point. I will get some other measure. And here, I want this measure to be exactly the same as new, okay? So Monge asks, basically, what is the, the, the set of instructions that I can give the worker that will recover exactly this measure new, but such that I'm paying the least price, the least cost. And the least cost in this case would be defined, could be defined as the integral of that elementary work for every x. So I take standard x, you tell me that I need to bring it at t of x, I do this for all, the red uh, mass here, and then in the end I have paid a price which is traveling a distance times the mass. So now this is the Morse story, and uh, to give you an idea, this is a story that mathematicians like a lot, because it involves taking a map from a set of points to a set of points, uh, then optimizing over maps, and typically those densities, as you can see here, I've they're continuous, and it's, they're continuous for a good reason. That Moore's, Moore's perspective really works when things are kind of smooth, and mathematicians like smooth things. Now, the other, sorry, I think I should, the other uh, perspective on optimal transport was given by a far more concrete uh, perspective, and one that uh, was uh, playing a big role in the, in the 20th century, and it's that of Kantorovich. So Kantorovich uh, usually is associated with his idea, but other people, of course, have worked on this. And uh, another famous name in the field is Tolstoy in the 30s, and Hitchcock in, in roughly at the same time in the US. So what they came up with was, so this is Kantorovich's book, and it's Mathematical Methods of Production and something like that. It's a very Soviet-sounding <laughs> name. Uh, but the, the ideas are there. Uh, and then in 41, uh, an American mathematician, Hitchcock, which also considers a similar problem, which is distribution of product from several sources to numerous localities. So let me just explain a bit what the Kantorovich problem is. And I'm going to use a, a language that's uh, to the point where Kantorovich was finding those ideas, and which is basically World War II. So imagine you have this, uh, the Stalingrad battle, it's, it's uh, 1942. And what you want to do is solve the following problem. You are a Red Army uh, general, and you have barracks with soldiers. And the number of soldiers is given here right next to the barrack. And this would be, made, let's say, 60,000 soldiers, 90,000, and 150,000 soldiers. And you need to bring them to the front, to the front line. And uh, what you need is that there is a, a prescribed number that you need to fulfill because Generals that are there told you we need 120,000 people, we need 90,000, and here we need 90,000. And then you have a network of roads that allow you to, to, to move those soldiers. And so Kantorovich's problem was to say, how can I do this in a good way, in a cheap way? And I will define a bit later what this means. There is a French version of this problem. It involves <laughs> baguettes and restaurants. And it's, you can find it in Villani's book. Actually, in, in Villani, he describes this problem where you have let's say restaurants that need bread and bakeries that produce bread, and you, there is a network between them, and then you need to um, bring that. Anyway, let's switch back to the, <laughs> to the Russian one. <laughs> so in the Russian one, we want to do this. So I think there's one very simple way that we can all agree with would work, and it's essentially the following. Here what we have is a probability distribution somewhat. If you sum up all these values, you get some, some number, I forgot what it is, 300, yes, 300. And we have 300 here and 300 here. What's, what, what, what is appearing, though, is that we have basically proportions. Here, the proportion of this uh, probability distribution is basically 433. 
And so what we could do is split this probability distribution with the same proportions, so 4, 3, 3, proportion 4, 3, 3, and 4, 3, 3. And then every barrack sends a right amount of soldiers to this blue, uh, the front line positions. So this would work like this. First, we have those soldiers moving around. And as you can see, there's a lot of foot traffic, right? There's a lot of <laughs> people moving around, but in the end, we get what we wanted, which is if we sum up those numbers, we get 120, 90, and 90. So what happened there? Basically, each barrack talked somewhat or was, or was related to each front line. And every, everything was done in an independent way, right? Somewhat, the only thing that happened, there, there, there was no real need for communication there. It was just send, send whatever have you troops, troops you have here in proportion to what I need. And as a result, this independent, if you want, a way of doing things has a, has, a nice, has a nice property, which is that it's kind of robust to what's going on. Imagine, I don't know, the Nazis bombed this road here. Well, still you would have a fair share of soldiers that would have get, got here or here or there, right? So you have something that's very robust, though, it seems to be also very costly because everybody was walking around regardless of what was the, the distance between this point and this point, right? In the end, I sent 18 soldiers from this barrack all the way down here and had to travel a lot. So on the other hand, there's a lot of cost involved in this robust kind of blind to what, what the problem is approach. So the naive approach results in a lot of displacements. Can we find a cheaper alternative? So this is really the idea of the, of the optimal transport problem. So what is the, the problem posed by, uh, considered by Kantorovich? Well, it's essentially the following. It's to say, well, it seems that there's a few things that characterize this problem. The first two things that I have clearly is I am comparing two histograms, and they have the same sum. They have the same total mass, the same number of soldiers. This is important. This can be relaxed. We might discuss this later. But at essence, what I'm comparing is just two histograms. And then there's one thing that appears here, which is essentially a network. And here, this can be summarized in terms of how far each barrack is from each uh, post, I mean, the front line position. And so the problem of optimal transport can be defined basically as, you give me two marginals, I can ship something from each of those points here to each of those landing points there, target points land there, and everything is parameterized in terms of distances or cost. I could use uh, some another measure, but it, it could be, for instance, time. It could be uh, gas, gas, gas that I need to pay for this, etc. Now, the optimal transport problem becomes, based on those two pieces of information, is to find a matrix of transportation which tells me any soldier that was available here, I mean, of those 60 soldiers, I need let's say 10 here, 40 here, and 10 here. And those numbers, you can give them a name, and I'm, I'm going to call them P1, P, I, J, okay? So I'm going to make this a bit more abstract. I have a marginal distribution, A1 to A3, B, A to B, C. I have a distance matrix of the same size. The constraints that I have, if you are a general, of course, is you cannot send more soldiers to the front line from this barrack than you, what the amount of soldiers that you had to start with, right? So if I have 60 soldiers here, it's natural that the sum of those three numbers sums to 60. It cannot be bigger than 60. And ideally, I don't want it to be smaller than 60 because that would mean that I'm not able to fulfill all the demand here. On the other hand, the other constraint that we have is that the sum of the columns here match what the front line needs. So th those are two, maybe this is a bit complicated as a formula, we'll see something a bit more compact. But essentially what I want is that the sum of the lines match what I have in the beginning, and the sum of the columns match what I have in the end. So if you're familiar with network flow programming, linear programming, you're, you already know, of course, about this. Otherwise, it sounds like a very natural conservation of mass constraint. The other thing is, how can I define the cost? Well, the cost will be defined a bit like Morse. So this is the, the, the common point. It will be the sum of the amount of soldiers that I send from one point location to a target location multiplied by the distance. So if I have to send 10 soldiers 100 kilometers, it's going to be 10 times cheaper than one soldier uh, 100 kilometers. It's, you can argue whether this is a good assumption or not. If you don't like this, you can actually try to 
provide uh, a different alternative formulations, and those exist. People have worked on those. But we will stick to this one. So the problem is basically minimizing this cost function, the sum of the PIHs, DIHs. And that's, that's the Kantorovich problem, which um, was on everyone's minds in the, in the 40s during the war, right? <laughs> the situation that I just gave you with soldiers, of course, applies for anything. Any resource that you have and you need to ship to any, any battle points, or that might be food, that might be uh, uh, fuel, anything. And so th it's not a surprise that these ideas were really, really explored and, and formalized in the, in, the, in the early 40s. And people started working very hard on them in the mid 40s, and people came up with nice algorithmic solutions in the late 40s with Danzig. So in this case, if you were to solve this problem, what you would find typically would be something like that. So what Kantorovich says is instead of doing things like completely independently, let's be a bit more rational and try to minimize this cost. And in this case, what you have is this. And then, of course, you have less movements, and this also fulfills your uh, goal to, 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 to mingle the soldiers. So to close this, uh, this introduction, let me just say that uh, I hope uh, those two examples were, uh, give you an intuition of what's going on. We have mass. We need to bring it somewhere else. Uh, in the Morse case, in the Morse formulation, what we were thinking about is applications, maps, telling me every infinitesimal amount of mass that I find somewhere here, I need to bring it somewhere else. And this Morse framework is uh, useful when you compare densities, okay, probability distributions. And so when you are doing statistics uh, or you're an analyst, you typically like to work with the Morse problem because you assume that everything is a continuous density. I hope you have captured the flavor, the slightly different flavor in the Kantorovich problem. In the Kantorovich problem, I wasn't really dis considering the distribution of soldiers, the continuous distribution of, of soldiers in the map, because there's nothing like that, right? Basically, there's only a few soldi soldiers scattered in the, in, 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 in the space, and then you need to do this uh, uh, transportation. And here, I used different tools. I, I was using more like a matrix perspective, right? I was talking about how you can assign things. And this will be a, a, also a common thread of, of, of uh, uh, the, the tools that we will use. So to summarize, this Morse perspective is more adapted when you consider probability distributions, and the Kantorovich perspective is more adapted when you consider uh, Dirac masses, that is um, empirical measures or, or data. So this is more the kind of math that we will be using. And so what I will be describing later is how can we speed up the computations of those optimal transport matrices not do it the way Kantorovich uh, and Danzig were proposing, but doing something that's a bit faster. And what can we say about, about this, and how can it be used in practice? So let's have lunch. Thank you very much.